2 Corinthians 3, verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Let's talk about that for a minute. Paul asks this question here in verse 1 after asserting in these last several verses at the end of chapter 2 that the gospel that, that he preached, that, that God's preachers preach, is always successful. We always are are triumphant. He said that he preached the word of God and and that he was not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. So he was very firm about that. The gospel we preach is the gospel. (laughs) It's always successful. But he qualifies all of that by insisting that he's not bragging about that. He's not... He's not puffing himself up, as some might think, and as he apparently had been accused of, in, uh, as, as we see in other places in this, in this letter. But the gospel is not a, a triumph because we're preaching it. It, it. The gospel is always a triumph because of who we preach. And that's what Paul is saying. As, as he confesses in verse 2, we're able ministers of the gospel, but that's God's doing. Um not in verse 2, but uh, a little bit further down in the context here. Uh, or Let's see, where was that? Anyway, he says we're able ministers of the gospel because God made us that way. Our sufficiency is of God. What's taught in verses 2 and 3 now, look at, look at this. This is always important to remember. You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. That's verse 6 I was talking about a minute ago. God hath made us. Our sufficiency is of God. Verse 6, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. So you see what he's saying. This is, uh, this is not boasting, but we, but we want everybody to know this gospel is, is, is a triumph. It's a win every time. It's always a sweet-smelling savor of Christ unto God, no matter who's preaching it. But here in verses 2 and 3, look at verse 3. Let's... let's uh, you're manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, but but we write with ink. But this this letter that we're that that validates our preaching is not written with ink. It's it's written by Christ with the Spirit of the Living God, and not on tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. In other words, it was when Paul was alive exactly as it is now. Men who don't have any business saying anything about God, much less from a pulpit, come with commendations from men. They come with paper. They come with letters. They come with impressive credentials and a lot of pretense and hypocrisy. And the more flash there is, the less substance there is. Paul said, we don't need any of that. We don't need a... a uh, letters bef- uh, after our name. We don't need recommendations. Religious leaders have to look important to hide the fact that they're imposters. Paul said, my gospel is not of man. It, it wasn't taught me by men, and it's not concerning man, it's concerning Christ. But religious so-called preachers, they crave the approval and commendations of men because they're not approved of God. Would the gospel be more precious to you if I was a a doctor of theology? Would that mean anything to you? If it would, then, then you're listening to me for the wrong reason. That's what Paul's saying here. You're our commendation, not... We don't need... 
If the Lord blesses the gospel to save sinners and to comfort his people, to feed his sheep, and that happens in your heart, not on a piece of paper. That's our letter. That's our approval. That's um, our encouragement. <clears throat> and you're our commendation. When he says you are our commendation, he's not saying that you brag on us and that's enough. It wasn't bragging at all in any way, but that you were saved by the gospel that we preach. That's the sense in which they were Paul's commendation. The end game for religion is earthly success. It's numbers, it's money, it's buildings, it's, it's a religious empire. The end game for God's preachers is that sinners are saved and the sheep of God fed and comforted. That, that's the principle here. It's not commendations and approvals and, and degrees and you know spectacular earthly hullabaloo. It's what's going on in here. What is God doing in the hearts of sinners? That's what a church is. That's, that's what we're doing. That's what we're in it for and then what God called us to. Now in verse three again, he said, letters from men are written with ink. And what do they say? They say big things about a man. Our letter, Paul said, is written by the Spirit of God on the heart. And it says big things about Christ. What God writes on your heart is a, a commendation of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's who he is, not who this preacher is. A completely different matter. Notice how Paul calls it the epistle of Christ, not the epistle of Paul, but Paul's epistle. That language is used elsewhere, but he's talking about the epistle. That's because Christ is the one exalted and not the man who wrote it. He's the author of it, and he's the subject of it, and his glory is the result of it. It's Christ's epistle. Verse 4, let's read verse 4 again. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. We're confident about that through Christ before God. This goes, this is all part of the context of where he's saying we're a sweet savor of Christ unto God. It's his approval that we're that that we are interested in, not man's. Uh, Paul trusted, and we trust that the success of the gospel preached of at the end of chapter two, that he spoke of, of how the gospel's a triumph, it's always successful, and the effectual nature of the gospel unto those whom God saves by that means, it's not attributable to us, but is through Christ. It's what he's doing, not what we're doing. We're doing what he's doing because he let us in on it. This is like the disciples said about that lame man. He said, don't look at us as though we did something in raising this lame man. This is the son of God whom you crucified that has shed abroad this here today. And that's true every time the gospel is preached. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. He said he'll commune with you here where two or three are met in his name. His gospel is preached. The Holy Spirit of God will take the things of Christ and reveal them to you. And in that context, what did, he, what did he call the Spirit of God? The Comforter. The Comforter. We need that all the time, don't we? We need his comfort. And that comfort comes from knowing who Christ is and what he did for us. Paul said in Galatians 1.10, Do I now persuade men or God? It's, it's through Christ and it's unto God. Not not for the approval of men. If, if men write a letter and put their name to it and say, you know, Paul's a great preacher, what, what does that mean? Our confidence is through Christ unto God, not men. Do I now persuade men or God? Are we trying to get men to do something for God? Or is our hope that God will do something for sinners? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Verse five, back in chapter three, verse five, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything 
as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. That, that verse elaborates on verse four. Our confidence is through Christ and it's unto God. And our trust that the ministry and our preaching is always successful has nothing to do with our own sufficiency. It's not based on that. That's not how we gauge the success of the gospel. It's who we preach that makes it a win every time. Not who's preaching it. We're not su- su- sufficient of, uh, at all. We are, we are confident, but not in our abilities. We're confident through Christ, verse 4. Paul asked the question at the end of chapter 2, who is sufficient for these things? And he answers it right here. Our sufficiency is of God. Ah, we, we, we rest in him. We lean on him. We trust him. Not just in the preaching, not just in the worship service, but everywhere we go, every day, all the time. In all things. Our sufficiency is of God. We could not preach this gospel without the grace of God in Christ. And if we could, we couldn't open your heart to receive it. If not for for God's grace, I'd be preaching the false, free will, antichrist, whatever passes for a gospel of this profane religious world. We have no sufficiency of ourselves. Verse six, for, uh, let's see, verse six, uh, who also hath made us able ministers, this is the verse I was trying to find a while ago, of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. And we, we, uh, we, we know what he means by letter and spirit but from verse seven, which we'll see in a minute, but, but what he's saying here. Is, is don't don't brag on God's ministers, but don't despise God's means either. Uh, when it comes to the preachers of the gospel, all of the glory belongs to God, and also they're to be heard as ambassadors of Jesus Christ because of whose name we come in. Uh, able minister, he makes this able minister. If he has a message for you and he's going to send a messenger, he's going to send somebody. He said, I'll give you pastors after my own heart. They're not going to think about themselves when they're preaching to me. They're not going to do it for for earthly gain or or, or, or pride or self-righteousness. They're going to do it out of love for God's sheep and they're going to tell you the truth. You know, that's just something God does. And I'm thankful for it because it would never happen any other way. Able ministers of the gospel, but he hath made us able ministers of the gospel. He gets all the glory, but don't despise the means. Don't despise what he does, who he sends. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, but we have this treasure. We have the treasure of God in Christ. Um. 2 Corinthians 5, 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. Be ye reconciled to God. That's the message we preach. And it's, it's, he's not saying it's kind of like God speaking to you. He said, it's God speaking to you. And what he's saying to you is come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Be ye reconciled to God. Come, let us reason together. About what? Your sin. But though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God calls sinners to come to himself so he can reveal our sin and and. and how that the precious blood of Christ alone can wash it away. And we are his ambassadors in that message. Now look what Paul says it is that we minister. Uh, Back in verse six again. Look at what we minister. Not the letter, but the spirit. 
And again, what he refers to here as the letter is the law. As we see in the next verse, he's talking about the tables of stone, the law that was given on Mount Sinai, the letter. Um, the old covenant as opposed to the new covenant, which he mentions in the same verse. Now, the letter is said to kill because that's all the law can do to a sinner. All the law can do is kill you or drive you to Christ. <laughs> that's it. The, by the law is the knowledge of sin, but there's no, by the deeds of the law, there's no justification before God. It's said to kill. We are condemned by that law. Our sin is revealed by that law. And if we stand before God on the footing of the law, we will forever perish. That's why it says that the letter kills. It'll either kill you and put you in hell or it'll kill self-righteous you and, and make a new you <laughs> by, by God's or Christ will the Holy Spirit will, will make and give you a new heart, a new make you a new man. The Spirit is said to give life and understand in what sense the word Spirit is used here. Of course, the Holy Spirit is involved in that. The Holy Spirit regenerates. He gives life as, as the Lord Jesus taught John in, or uh, Nicodemus in John 3. It's the Spirit that, that uh, blows where he wills and he gives life to whom he will. But this is the sense in which he used the word spirit here because he's talking about the preaching of the gospel, remember. He's talking about our message, our, the ministry that the Lord has given us. So turn with me to John chapter 6, and I believe we'll see in what sense the word spirit is used in our text. It absolutely has to do with the Holy Spirit. But look what, what, look what the Lord says here in John six sixty three. This is the specific sense, I believe, in which Paul uses the word spirit there. John 6, 63, our Lord Jesus talking to the, to the religious Jews. He said, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. See, that's, that's the, the, the letter and the spirit. But what does he mean by spirit? The words that I speak unto you. They are spirit. He's talking about the spiritual nature of the gospel. All the, all the law can do is, is sit there on a table of stone and tell you what to do and what not to do and condemn you if you know what the law actually says in a spiritual sense. It, it, it can't do anything. It can't give you life, spiritual life. But the, but the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. And they are life. And look what the disciples said. Let's read down a little bit further. You know the context. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. And from that time, they, they, showed, they, they uh, demonstrated exactly what he said. You can't come to me unless the Father draw you. And sure enough, they couldn't. They, they went back. And walk no more with him. But then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? And then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. I believe that's the sense in which Paul uses the word spirit. He's talking about the gospel preached. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. That's where spiritual life comes from. The words of eternal life. The law can't give life. It just reveals the extent of our death. But the gospel, the, the gospel and the spirit, uh, the spiritual truth of God in Christ is the words of eternal life. Paul said to Timothy, that gospel that's able to make you wise unto salvation. So you see the it's that word of Christ. The old covenant was up to us. You want it to be up to you, like religion's always saying, and keep the law. That's up to you. God's not going to keep the law for you if your footing is law before him. If you believe on Christ, then he did keep the law for you. 
But if you're on a foot a footing of law before God, that it's up to you. The old the old covenant was this: do and live. The message of new covenant is, I will and you shall. It's not up to you. It's up to him. That's why it works. <laughs> That's why it's successful. The requirement of the old covenant is do. The blessing and message of the new covenant is done. Look what he did. Look what he did for sinners. The old covenant was written on tables of stone, as Paul refers to here. The new covenant is written on the heart of a sinner. He said, I'll write my law on your heart. And he does. And that's why Paul was able to say, I, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. I can't keep it. So who's going to save me? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans chapter 7. The old covenant reveals the problem, our sin. The gospel reveals the Savior. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The gospel is Christ. Look at verses 7 through 11. Let's read these together in our text. Verse 7. But we have, let's see, I keep wanting to read from chapter 4. Verse 7 of chapter 3, But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. The gospel reveals the glory that excels that of the law. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth, is glorious. Now, Paul clearly describes here what he calls the ministration of death as the giving of the law, Mount Sinai, and the glory of God revealed there. His glory indeed was revealed there. They couldn't even look at it. They couldn't look at the mountain. There was glory there because it's the law of God. The, the, the law is not evil. You are. The fact that the law can't save you is not an indictment against the law. It's an indictment against you. God's law is glorious because his, he is glorious. But look at what he says. Mount Sinai, there was glory revealed there, but we, and we don't make void the law by the preaching of the gospel, Paul said. Yea, we establish the law. It's only Christ fulfilling the law for his people and paying our sin debt where we've broken the law. That's the only way that the law is honored. He's the only one that ever honored the law. And that happens by the gospel, by Christ crucified, not by your obedience. So we don't make void the law when we preach the gospel. We establish the law. It's only by the gospel that the law is honored and glorified in Christ. Sinai was a place of God's glory insomuch that the children of Israel could not even look at it. And Sinai's glory is not diminished by the gospel it's not replaced by the gospel. It just excels the glory of the law. It includes that glory, but, but there's much more glory. What the law could not do in that it was weak through our flesh, God sent his son to do. And that's the glory that excelleth. It's Christ honoring the law, not getting rid of the law, not, not retracting the law. He honored the law. He kept the law. He observed the law in thought, word, and deed perfectly. So you see, the glory of Sinai is not replaced. It's just excelled. <laughs> Notice that he says, in this sense, in this sense, it was done away. Not that, that, that God's law, law is done away, but in this sense it is, by the glory that excelleth. Because that law given to us to keep, there's no glorification in that. There's no glory in that. There's no success in that. We can never do it. God's not going to be honored that way. 
And so it's that as a covenant unto us that's done away with. That's not how sinners can be saved. By the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in God's sight. So that old covenant was done away with, but not the law. Sinai's glory is not diminished. That was the glory of God there that was shining that they couldn't look at. But the glory of the gospel exceeds that of Sinai because though God's glory is revealed in the law, God's greatest glory is his love and mercy towards sinners. And included in that is Christ obeying the law. If God had merely given his law and all sinners were condemned by it and went to hell for it, would God not still be glorious? It wouldn't diminish his glory at all. Ah, but bless God, while Moses was yet on Mount Sinai, he's still up there. He was up there for 40 days and nights, I believe it was. And he's still up there and God said, make a mercy seat. Make a mercy seat. Do you see the glory of that? That's the glory that excelleth. He gave us the law and said, don't do this and do this. And before before we even broke it, he said, make a mercy seat. (laughs) The mercy seat that contained the law, the preserved law, of God inside that ark, which was under the mercy seat. And that's Exodus 25, 17. While Moses was yet in Mount Sinai, make a, thou shalt make a mercy seat. His law is given, but there's mercy for sinners, for those who break that law. There's going to be mercy. I'm going to have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. And inside the ark, under that mercy seat was the law of God. And upon that mercy seat, the blood of the lamb was applied. Christ, our mercy seat, that's the glory that excelleth. When Moses asked God to show him God's glory, God did not begin to say, thou shalt and thou shalt not. He said, I'll be gracious. I'll be gracious. Gracious to who? Lawbreakers. Those that are guilty That's what sin is. It's disobeying God's law in thought, word, and deed. And he said, I'll be gracious. The glory that excelleth doesn't do away with the law. When Paul says that the law had no glory, he's careful to point out that it is in this respect, there's a glory that supersedes that. There's a glory that that, that swallows that glory up and shines forth brighter than any star. There's a glory that excelleth. The glory of Christ not only magnifies the law and makes it honorable, Isaiah 42, 21, but God's greatest glory that he's ever revealed to sinners is seen in Christ crucified. It's revealed on Calvary where he gave his only begotten son that whosoever that believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What Paul says is done away in verse 11 is not the law itself, but the covenant of the law. That's done away. That's what Paul said in Romans 10, 4. He said Christ is the end of of something. The goal of it, he's the goal of the law given, but he's also the end of it. It's over with. What is he talking about? The law for righteousness. Not the end of the law. It does not say in Romans 10, 4, Christ is the end of the law. He's the end of the law for righteousness. He's the the termination of me trusting in my law keeping to be righteous before God. He is the termination of me going about in that same context, going about to establish my own righteousness. Christ is my righteousness. So why would I trust my keeping of the law anymore? The law for righteousness is is vanity. I can't have righteousness if it only comes by the law. But Paul talks about in Romans 3, that law, that that, that, uh, righteousness without the law. You remember that terminology in Romans chapter 3? The righteousness without the law is now revealed. 
in that God revealed his son to be a propitiation for our sins. He set forth his son. He sent his son to be a sin offering. That's both the termination of the law for righteousness and the goal of it. The purpose that he gave the law was what? Christ for his people. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The ministration of the law, verse 9, is the ministration of condemnation because the law reveals our evil but can't do anything about it. It's called the ministration of condemnation because by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in the sight of God, Romans 3.20. The new covenant is called the ministration of righteousness. Because that righteousness required by the old covenant law is fulfilled by Christ in the new. God doesn't do away with his standard for righteousness when he saves a sinner. You just don't seek any longer the righteousness that comes by the law. But you seek it, Romans chapter 11, by faith in God's Son. By believing on him and trusting him as your only righteousness before God. Christ fulfilled the law and paid our sin debt. And God says in the new covenant, your sins and your iniquities will I remember no more. So the new covenant is the ministration of righteousness without the law for us. Without us keeping the law for righteousness. That's the glory that excelleth. That's the glory that we minister. That's the glory that we preach. Christ and what he did. The new covenant it, it is up to him, not us. It, it depends on him, not us. The glory of God's righteousness and holiness are magnified only in Christ and him crucified. Do you think it honors God's law for you to do some little something <clears throat> that you think is a work of righteousness down here. Everything we do is full of sin. If you trust anything, he said, even if you be circumcised, which is the first thing in the law, Christ will profit you nothing. If you do it in order to please God, if you do it as, your, as even a portion of your righteousness before God, Think of it, the glory of God's righteousness and holiness are magnified only on the cross. You tell me where else God's law is honored. Where else? How else? The glory of God's love is magnified in the death of Christ and only there. Because herein is love. His righteousness and holiness are magnified because only by Christ's suffering and death could the law be satisfied. His love is magnified because herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the sin offering for our sins. The glory of God's grace is magnified in this glory that excelleth. Because the glory of God that is seen only in the face of his son. Because he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not also freely? That's the glory of his grace magnified nowhere else. But in that he spared not his own son. And how shall he not then also freely give us all things? every blessing he has everything good God can do for you is yours in Christ Christ is that glory that excelleth and like Paul by God's grace we determine to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified Amen let's pray